So good morning uh, and very welcome to Nobel Forum for the announcement of this year's Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So my name is Thomas Perlman and I'm the Secretary General of the Nobel Assembly. So I'll first make the announcement in Swedish and then followed by English. And we will then uh, present some background to the prize and open up for any possible questions. Nobelförsamlingen vid Karolinska institutet har idag beslutat att Nobelpriset i fysiologi eller medicin år 2020 ska delas lika mellan Harvey J. Alter, Michael Horton och Charles M. Rice för upptäckten av hepatit C-virus. Så på engelska, the Nobel Assembly at Karolinska Institutet has today decided to award the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine jointly to Harvey J. Alter, Michael Horton and Charles M. Rice for the discovery of hepatitis C virus. So here are the three laureates. Harvey Alter was born in 1935 in New York. He performed his prize-winning studies at the National Institutes of Health, Department of Transfusion Medicine, uh, at the Clinical Center in Bethesda, where he remains active. Michael Horton was born in the United Kingdom and performed his prize-winning studies at Chiron Corporation uh, in Emeryville in California. In 2010, he relocated to the University of uh, Alberta in Canada, where he remains active. Charles Rice was born in 1952 in Sacramento in California. He performed his prize-winning studies uh, at the Washington University in St. Louis. In 2001, he relocated to Rockefeller University in New York, where he remains active. Now, Professor Gunilla Carlson Hedestam, mem Hedestam, member of the Nobel Committee, will describe the discovery. So please, Gunilla. This year's Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine awards the discovery of the hepatitis C virus, a major cause of liver inflammation, also known as hepatitis. In their latest report, the World Health Organization estimated over 70 million cases of hepatitis C globally. This is likely an underestimation as many cases go undiagnosed. Hepatitis C causes 400,000 deaths annually, and it's one of the most common causes of liver cancer and liver transplantation. There are three main types of viruses that infect the liver, hepatitis A, B, and C viruses. These three viruses are different from each other and belong to different families, and they cause different types of disease. Hepatitis A, is transmitted via water or contaminated food and causes an acute infection that typically resolves within a couple of weeks and leads to lifelong immunity. In contrast, hepatitis B and C causes a chronic infection and is transmitted via the blood. Chronic inflammation of the liver is a serious medical condition since the liver is responsible for several key physiological processes. Defects in the function of the liver can therefore be life-threatening. Chronic hepatitis is a silent but progressive disease that destroys the function of the liver over years to decades. Usually without symptoms, but eventually it leads to a chronic 
serious condition that can um, result in cirrhosis and liver cancer. Once the disease has progressed this far, it can only be treated with costly and resource-intensive liver transplantations. An increasing number of chronic hepatitis cases was first noted some 70 years ago in patients that had received multiple blood transfusions. It was also noted occasionally in patients that had received various forms of therapeutics that were purified from donated blood. In 1967, Baruch Blomberg discovered the hepatitis B virus, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for this discovery in 1976. This was a key discovery, but it did not explain all cases of chronic hepatitis. The situation was becoming alarming because the disease was silent and progressive, it was impossible to know who of all apparently healthy blood donors were carriers of the disease. An improved understanding of blood transmitted hepatitis was urgently needed to identify blood donors who were carriers. In the late 1960s, Harvey Walter, a clinician who had collaborated with Bloomberg, was now working at the NIH Blood Bank. He embarked on an ambitious project to investigate the source of post-transfusion hepatitis. He realized that even after hepatitis B contaminated blood was excluded through testing, most hepatitis cases remained. To determine the magnitude of this problem, he systematically tested the blood supply for the presence of known candidate viruses and he tracked individuals who developed hepatitis after a blood transfusion. Through this work, he could show that an astonishingly high number of hepatitis cases could not be explained by the known viruses. At this point, he strongly suspected that there was another infectious agent causing the disease. Alter was not alone in suspecting that a mysterious, mysterious hepatitis cases were caused by an infection, but this was not yet formally demonstrated. In 1978, Alter demonstrated that plasma from patients with this form of hepatitis could transfer the disease to chimpanzees. The animals developed signs of liver inflammation, and this result strongly supported that the causative agent was infectious. Further work by Alter and colleagues over the following years showed that the agent had the properties of a virus. The quest to isolate the virus could now start. But this proved to be extremely challenging and took several more years. The breakthrough came in 1989 when Michael Horton and colleagues working at Chiron Corporation used a combination of molecular biology and immunology based techniques to clone the virus. That this would work was not obvious as it depended on two assumptions. First, that genetic material would be present in a collection of DNA se sequences isolated from hepatitis infected animal. And second, that serum from a human with this form of hepatitis contained antibodies that were specific for the virus and that could be used as a molecular hook in the screen. Starting with the blood from an infected animal, uh, the team in introduced DNA fragments into bacteria and where each bacteria expressed an individual protein fragment. By screening with the antibodies, they could isolate one positive clone. This was a high-risk project, but the positive clone turned out to encode for a sequence that resembled sequences of a virus family called flaviviruses. They named the virus the hepatitis C virus. This was the first time these types of molecular-based approaches were used to identify a novel virus. The Horton Group immediately took advantage of this knowledge and started to work on establishing a blood test to identify hepatitis C-infected blood. This was urgently needed, and once they had developed the test, they evaluated it blindly on Alter's serum collection from the NIH blood bank. This successfully identified all the samples that were suspected to be contaminated, but none of the control samples. 
The availability of a test that showed this kind of high specificity and sensitivity was a major step forward. Soon, blood supplies around the world could be screened. And this immediately led to a dramatic decrease in the number of post-transfusion cases of hepatitis. One important question remained. Was the hepatitis C virus alone the cause of this form of hepatitis? That is, could a molecularly cloned virus reproduce the disease? Charles Rice, then working at Washington University in St. Louis, and others investigated the molecular requirements for viral replication. They identified a highly conserved three prime end of the viral genome, which they thought was important. When Rice and his team tested these um, clones containing this region, they first could not observe replication in animals. Rice then speculated that the clones they had used contained inactivating mutations somewhere in the genome, shown here as red dots. He knew that RNA viruses of this type are error prone and acquire random mutation in their genomes during their replication. Production of such genetically diverse swarms of viruses benefits the virus population as a whole, but it means that individual clones can be defective. He therefore sequenced many clones and compared them to each other. He observed that several of these clones contained potentially inactivating mutations, which he could remove through genetic engineering. When he combined such a repaired genome with a three prime end of the genome, he had created what he hoped would be a functional virus. When this genome was injected into the liver of chimpanzees, he observed clinical signs of hepatitis, an infectious virus was now present in the blood, and it persisted over time. This provided conclusive evidence that the cloned hepatitis C alone could cause the disease and induce a productive infection. The laureate's achievements provided the foundation that was needed to now start combating the spread of the virus. Thanks to the effective blood screening programs, the hepatitis C virus is now almost eliminated in many parts of the world, and the development of highly effective antiviral drugs means that more than 95% of treated patients can be cured from the infection. These developments have saved millions of lives worldwide. Continued efforts to implement blood screening programs and treatments globally raise hopes that a hepatitis C virus can be controlled and eventually eliminated. To summarize, the pioneering work of this year laureates is a landmark achievement in our ongoing battle against virus infections. Starting with Harvey Alter's demonstration that a new virus was responsible for a majority of post-transfusion hepatitis cases, and Michael Horton's groundbreaking work to clone the virus and develop a blood test that could be used to exclude contaminated blood, and then leading to the elegant work by Charles Rice showing that a molecularly cloned hepatitis virus alone could cause persistent infection and reproduce the disease observed in humans. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will now proceed and see if there are questions. And um, uh, I'd like to present here, uh, way back there, uh, Nils Joran Larsson, who is a member of the Nobel Committee. Uh, Patrick Anfors, also a member of the Nobel Committee and also the committee chair. Uh, och, and Gunilla Carlson Hedestam, who you just heard, who is also a member of the Nobel Committee. So, uh, are there any questions? There are not so many this year, so yeah, here, here's one question. Right, so I was able to reach two of the laureates. Uh, 
uh, Harvey Alter and Charles Rice. Uh, I woke them up uh, and they uh, were very surprised. Uh, I, they were definitely not sitting by the phone because I called them a couple of times before uh, without any answer. But once I reached them, they were extremely surprised and, and uh, really uh, happy and, and speechless almost. Uh, so it was really fun to talk to them. Any more? Any other? I'll, I'll throw out the question to Nils Joran. I mean, uh, before the discovery of the hepatitis C virus, it what, was a bit like a Russian roulette to get the blood transfusion. So I think it has benefited millions of people that we now can have safe uh, blood transfusion and uh, safe blood products. Uh, any more? I think I saw one hand. Please. Um, so you keep thinking of the new Patrick, maybe you want to dwell on that. Well, I think it's, it's relatively easy to relate to today's situation. I mean, the first thing you need to do is to identify the causing virus. And once that has been done, uh, that is in itself the starting point for development of, of uh, drugs to treat the disease and also to, to develop vaccines against the disorder. So the actual discovery, viral discovery itself, is a critical moment. Uh, in, and as you can realize, obviously, today, uh, it's that the, the methods have evolved dramatically since the 70s and 80s when these discoveries were done. Uh, today, massive parallel sequencing uh, and PCR technologies has replaced a lot of the very tedious and, and uh, cumbered, very difficult methods that were used to discover hepatitis C. Maybe I just could add that also reason for uh, that there are several decades before the prize is awarded is of course also that uh, it takes time before it's fully apparent how beneficial a discovery is. Uh, and of course, I mean, these serological tests have been around for quite a while, but uh, the antiviral drugs that emerged as a consequence of this, uh, this uh, significant discovery uh, have been much more recent. Anything more right now? I know there are many who want to have interviews. Any other question? So we have unusually few questions this year, but then we'll conclude this part of the press conference and go on to the interviews. Thank you very much for coming here today.